Everybody, welcome to HackerCast. This is White Hat Security's weekly video on how we go over all the cool things that have happened in application security this week. My name is Jeremiah Grossman. I am the CEO and founder of White Hat Security, and I'm here with uh, Matt Johansson, Hello. Nestor of TRC Houston, and I think he's cheating on uh, No Shave November, right? I think that's what's going on there. I got a little head start. <laughs> I, you know, I, I thought No Shave November last year just meant for the year, and I got... <laughs> <laughs> and we also got Robert R. Stankhansen with us today from Austin. I think it's actually Movembeard is what it oh, is. Movembeard. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robert, I noticed behind you, you got two of your screens are on, and then one's not. What's going on there? Uh, well, one of my computers decided to take a total dump, uh, and I have yet to fix it, so my sysadmin admin <laughs> skills have failed me a little bit, because uh, I think it's a hardware problem. <laughs> I think that's actually the, the computer that Robert has hooked up to the Matrix, and he just doesn't <laughs> show it to us. That, that could be. But, and, and, and so Matt has to, it takes, a you know, leadership privileges to a whole nother level, has to get himself, like, three feet away from the soda machine? Yeah, this is actually my office, and those don't let any of those fool you. This is scotch. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a conference room. It's called Hyrule, as you can tell. <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's talk some uh, some application security stuff. So there's a lot that went on this week. You know, every single week I say the same thing. Lots going on. Uh, the the first one that I that we saw was uh, the jQuery validation plugin, a cross site scripting issue in it. And uh, Matt, you were looking at this one, right? Yeah, uh, this one's kind of nasty. So a uh, a researcher by uh, Simon by the name of Simon uh, Roof. Sorry if I mispronounce your last name. Uh, posted this blog yesterday uh, at the time of filming this, and yeah, this jQuery validation plugin, which tends to be very, very popular, it's uh, part of the latest version of of, uh, of this plugin, version 1.13, uh, if any of you are interested in this kind of thing, and uh, it's vulnerable to cross-site scripting pretty blatantly, it's uh, pretty easy, uh, and it's really, really widely used, it looks like the uh, during the research, this this guy checked out that it's on uh, just by looking in Google really quick and trying to find uh, instances of this uh, plugin. He found it on like thirteen thousand websites. Uh, but then, if he actually looked a little bit further and and Googled the vulnerable code, uh, like this PHP code that was the same code that's a vulnerable in this plugin. Uh, he found it on something like 330,000 websites, uh, and that was just whatever you know PHP code he could find publicly on Google. So you know, r in reality, this could have be affecting potentially who knows, right? Millions of websites. This is yeah, pretty, yeah, uh, he, said, he said millions, but uh, actually, for those that don't know, what is, why do people, what's jQuery for? It's for very nasty things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally hate jQuery myself, so someone non-biased can answer that question. <laughs> I, I, I think jQuery is a, I guess it's a, it's a JavaScript framework that kind of flattens all the cross-browser compatibility issues. So you'll, you see it used everywhere. I think even Akamai hosts this thing, and I think Google hosts this thing, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I jQuery gives me headaches and makes me need more coffee. But, uh, <laughs> There's the scotch machine behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the actual vulnerable code here uh, was this really simple, unvalidated input that you just tag at the end of the URL. Super simple cross-site scripting vulnerability. We'll include the link in the, in the, uh, the blog post here. Um, but the interesting part that I think was kind of funny about this whole vulnerability, besides how widespread it was, uh, the researcher includes a disclosure timeline uh, going back to August, where he reported the vulnerability to the developer of the plugin. Then in September, he sent him a reminder. It was like three weeks later. Uh, and then maybe four weeks after that, uh, this researcher just uh, emails a generic jQuery function email, like info at jQuery.org. Uh, and then later in November, notified everyone involved, hey, if I don't hear back from any of you, because he hadn't heard any response from jQuery or this plugin developer, hey, if I don't get any response, I'm going to uh, publicly disclose this vulnerability. Right? This was November 13th or 14th. Uh, it's not fixed in the latest version. November 18th, he goes full public disclosure on his web blog. 
Uh, and then if you scroll all the way down to the b bottom of the blog post, uh, within 17 hours that I went full public disclosure, the vulnerability in jQuery validation plugin was patched. <laughs> oh, so that's how it works. <laughs> uh, full disclosure works, people, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. What, wasn't there also something about this This bug went back like seven years? Oh, yeah, that's the other really cool part. He did some more Googling and found it in open source uh, uh, a vulnerability database, OSVDB, uh, going back to at least... 2013, uh, that this was in there. So, uh, so, it, so it's not just it's not just going full disclosure. It's writing a blog post and and making fun of people. That's how it works. Apparently. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. All right. <laughs> All right. So we had this other story that came up, and uh, this one actually made a whole lot of news. There's a new certificate authority out there. Normally, when this happens, no one really cares. There's only like 150 certificate authorities in every single browser. Um, but this certificate authority was is called Let's Encrypt, and uh, this is pretty cool because they want they, they you go to letsencrypt.org and it's an open source not an open source a nonprofit organization uh, sponsored by Mozilla, Akamai, Cisco, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Identrust, and they have a it's a free and open certificate authority. So they have an automated process to sign your certificate. So you prove you own the domain, you prove you own the website, you submit and you get back a cert. So they take all the cost out of the equation. So basically they want to SSL everything. So now it's everybody else's responsibility to put their certs up there and they have this great package manager app up there to make the process really, really easy. Um, so one that's cool. Second question is is actually Robert probably knows a lot about this. Um, what does that do to all the other for-profit CAs out there? Yeah, but I think the even more interesting question is: Are the other browsers going to support it? I mean, Mozilla, sure, but I mean they're only 20, 28 percent or so of the market share right now. The uh, if Google doesn't support it, it really doesn't matter whether you have a certificate or not because you know no one's going to be able to go to your website without getting a cert warning. So, so, so it, obviously it'll go into Firefox as Mozilla is supporting it. Um, then you got to get Google and IE. Is there any particular reason why Microsoft or Google wouldn't support the CA? Well, I mean, they may not support it at the same time frame. It might take them six months to a year to validate it. Uh, there's a big checklist. I know that uh, Mozilla knows a lot about that because they have to do that kind of stuff. But um, sure, I mean, they might just say, well, we don't want to support it because you know we are in bed with uh, Verizon or. Sorry, not Verizon. What am I saying? Uh, VeriSign or one of those bigger uh, CAs, or maybe there's some backend stuff that they don't like about it. I mean, who knows, right? Um, I would be really curious to hear. I mean, I think it'd be bad publicity-wise if they didn't support it, but I'd be curious to hear them say, "Yes, we will support this." I guess we'll keep an eye out for that one. But it's cool. I mean, you know, more and more of the web is getting encrypted. Remember the story about Cloudflare? They're encrypting all their stuff now. Um, you know, free SSL for everybody. So that's uh, that's all pretty cool. We're getting, getting more crypto on the web. We got rid of Telnet mostly, so maybe we we'll get rid of <laughs> HTTP mostly. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think one of the important things here is that you know, let's not overblow it and say that this is the end of for-profit CAs. But this is good because it will drive a lot of the price down and, and open the doors to certain people that couldn't have used this before to be able to use it. So. Yeah, especially in like third world countries where you know a, a two or three hundred dollar cert might be the difference between them eating that month and not eating that month. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it really democratizes security. So we so uh, you know so when we talk about crypto, obviously it's a confidentiality and privacy conversation. So as it might happen, we had uh, another story come up, and the title of the blog post was Six Links That Will Show You What Google Knows About You." So <laughs> Matt, take us through this one because you know it's not like Google collects a whole lot of information about us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think this stuff will surprise anyone in this Google Hangout. Uh, I don't think this will surprise a decent amount of our audience, uh, but it did certainly surprise a significant amount of people who might not be aware of a lot of the stuff that Google collects. But the the six links, the one that I found the funniest was you could actually look at their advertising profile of you. Like, <laughs> what? Okay, Matt, what was yours? Full disclosure. I was I was gonna try to avoid that one. <laughs> Parts of it were right. They they knew I was a, a, a male. They got my age range correctly, 
but then they started saying that I liked uh, reggaeton and uh, <laughs> 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 they started you know, yeah. using the computer. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah, they they, <laughs> they 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 got a few things just out of left field. I have no idea how they got on there. It's pretty funny, right? But it's called cross the request forgery, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was that was pretty interesting. I've seen some funny people, the funny things that people have been saying over there. The one that creeped me out the most, even though that I knew that they were tracking this to a certain degree. Uh, but if you have an Android mobile device at all, or if you use Google Maps as like your little GPS in your car, there's a link for maps.google.com slash location history. And it has every little dot that you've hit that it has any time that your phone is pinged out and oh, said, hey, hey, like this is where you are. It has the date and the time that you were there. So, I mean, all over my house, all over everything. It's, it's pretty nasty. Um. Yeah, that's that's gross. That, but, that you, one was, but you knew that, Matt. Why are you surprised by it? I'm not. It, it wasn't that I was surprised of that they were tracking my location. It's how precisely they were tracking my location that was surprising. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, I, the other thing I thought was pretty interesting was that you needed six links to see everything that Google knew about you, or at least they were able to present. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is uh, what they're willing to present exactly. That's a, that's a really good point. Uh, the rest of the links really are actually good for lay people to actually get a look at. This is stuff that any of us probably click on every once in a while if, if we use a Google account, but the devices that have access to your Google account, uh, the other third-party apps that you've given permission to your Google account, like if you ever said sign in with your Google account somewhere, they have a lot of permissions Right, so you go and you can kind of review a lot of that stuff. This is things that I did research when I was doing my Chrome extension research back in 2011 that, that came up and they were cool attack avenues of, I've got cross-site scripting in Chrome, it has access to all of this stuff. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, and they, they know a lot more than that. They uh, There's like 126 or something different metrics they use to try to figure out who people are just through their, their front door, through their, their normal web application. Um, and I'm sure that's growing all that time, and that doesn't even include things like you said, like mobile and all this other stuff that gives them a lot more uh, different types of indicators. So, um, in a similar vein, you know, Firefox just switched their search engine to Yahoo, which I think is really interesting because that'll be one very large piece of data that they won't have access to anymore. That's, that's big. That's big. Yeah. I mean, how many billions did Yahoo pay Mozilla for that? Uh, about well, let's see, 300 million. Well, so while Google was paying 300 million a year, we'd have to assume it's near that. But there's a five-year contract instead of a three-year contract like they had with Google. So my guess is somewhere around 1.5 billion at least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, well, it's fun. Well, I did something rather ironic when I saw this six-link story came up. Is I posted it to Facebook and I said, "Look, what it, look what Google knows about you," and I'm there. I'm posting it to Facebook. <laughs> 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 well, okay. <laughs> Terror posts from Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so, Robert, there was something about a, a judge making a ruling on what passwords or information to unlock your devices that a person must give law enforcement. Yeah, so this really more affects phones currently, but I think long term this can affect a lot of other things. For instance, um, a lot of stuff is tied to your device, your physical device. And if you ever get rid of a password, let's say, and, n and now everything's just purely biometrics, purely your phone, the judge basically said that you can be compelled to give up something you have, like a fingerprint, but you cannot be compelled to give up something you know, like a password. So if you're relying entirely on biometrics or some second factor authentication instead of a first factor or whatever, you know, just the second one, just the thing you have as opposed to just a combination of something you have and something you know, they can basically compel you to give uh, them access to whatever it is they want access to, which is pretty terrifying. So um, you really, really should consider having both if you can, um, or at minimum, you know, definitely have a good, strong password. Just if you're worried about judges compelling you to do things. <laughs> well, you know, when you when you brought up the story, right, I immediately thought of my 
you know, iPhone here, and that has the the fingerprint, you know, code thing. And you know, before it was just you type in your four-digit PIN, you unlock the device. But I really don't have a choice now. Like I, I put my thumbprint on it, and it unlocks it. So if I could be compelled to put my thumb on it to unlock it, like I can't do both on these things. Yeah, I know. Scary, huh? <laughs> but thanks for that. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, let's talk China <laughs> oh and something I called an EdgeCast. So what's 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 EdgeCast, and why did China block them? Well, China has made a pretty bold move. I think they blocked like a, over a hundred different big websites fairly recently. But one of the ones I thought was particularly interesting was they blocked uh, EdgeCast CDN, which is you know just a CDN service. It's like blocking Akamai or something. Um, or, or S3 or something. You know, if you block <laughs> something as prevalent as a CDN, that could affect you know maybe a hundred thousand websites or more, big websites too, not just tiny little ones. You know, people who use CDNs tend to be bigger websites because uh, they can afford to use CDNs. But um, you know, it, it, it's almost like China is trying to do this just to ruin the internet, so people <laughs> won't in China will go, well, the rest of the internet screwed up. I'll just stick to like local sources because you know all those American sites are always broken. <laughs> I don't know. So so, uh, so lots going on this week. You know we got vulnerabilities, we got CAs, China blocking stuff, so all kinds of fun uh, fun stuff out there. So uh, are you guys doing anything differently? Like like I I just actually rebuilt all my Macs and changed all my passwords because you know for whatever reason I just don't trust so I changed I have a different unique password for everything and I changed them all and so uh, are you guys doing anything differently like that these days? Yeah, I've, I've started I've started double wrapping some of my crypto. You know, I think uh, you know we we see things like SSL get broken all the time, but usually it requires some sort of information uh, like about like HP headers or whatever some other knowledge. But if you sort of double wrap things in crypto, it makes it much harder because you you know you don't really know what the underlying crypto is going to be that you get across the wire. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, whenever you can have a fallback, um, but that that's a minor thing really compared to all the other security problems there are, like USB. Geez, I mean, how many, often do you go to a conference and you know leave your computer alone just for a few minutes? You know, never. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> actually, I think there's a you know they call it the when I, cause I, have to, I go to conferences and hotels, and I have to, sometimes have to leave my laptop in my hotel room, and you have the uh, the evil maid attack, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I forget the person who wrote, who wrote the app, but there's this little app called I Tried, and uh, it logs anytime somebody uh, tries to log into your computer, you know, and fails it, and it snaps a picture of them with the Mac. So uh, <laughs> you get back. In. So that would be kind of horrifying. You're trying to log into somebody's computer, it snaps a picture, and you know you're not going to get it. Like, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> throw it in the trash and <laughs> break it. <laughs> At that point, you just have to resort to theft. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I wonder why I was missing my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we had enough fun for today. Uh, this has been HackerCast. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Matt. I'll see you guys next week. Take it easy. Bye now.